Let's have a bit of a discussion then about the um, three presentations this morning, um, the quite significant changes in the process and the chain of events that occur in Ireland, the very um, many innovations that the Fair Work Commission has um, undertaken in Australia and the potential to use artificial intelligence mechanisms in um, dispute resolution in industrial relations. So does anyone um, from the audience want to kick off with a question of any of the panellists or a comment or an observation about the work that you've been doing? Yes, thank you, Andrew. Professor Andrew Stewart from the University of Adelaide. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, thank you very much for three really fascinating presentations. The, the first two had um, weird echoes for me of um, policy that uh, informed the design of our current fair work legislation, which was the forward with fairness policy in 2007. It talked about um, the concept of a one-stop shop, a new agency with the horrific name of Fair Work Australia. Thank goodness we've moved on beyond that. Um, uh, but a couple of the elements, I think, were reflected in, in the first two presentations. Um, one of them was the idea that um, Fair Work Australia would have offices in shopping centres. Well, it, it, that never happened, but it seems interesting now that if you replace shopping centres with libraries, perhaps we're, we're now coming round in Australia to think about that. But I actually wanted to touch on the other idea, which is to have a range of different functions embodied in the, st in the same body, and clearly Ireland has done that. Um, uh, we're seeing here at least two of our state tribunals looking at res being restructured to have a much broader range of jurisdictions. So in Queensland, their Industrial Relations Commission has now taken over their anti-discrimination complaints. In South Australia, the South Australian Employment Tribunal um, is its jurisdiction is steadily expanding, but the goal seems to be to um, to include discrimination, uh, already includes workers' compensation. Um, uh, so, uh, but I had a couple of questions, Una, about the Irish experience of, of doing this. One was uh, when you did come to to look at having adjudication of these different areas, which you know intuitively seems to make sense to have them dealt with by a single body. Um, were there any problems in doing that? But particularly one aspect of the original Fair Work Australia program, which got very quickly sunk as soon as there was an attempt to implement it, was to have investigation and inspection as part of the same body. Of course, in Australia, we've ended up with a distinctly separate organisation, the Fair Work Ombudsman, to do that. Um, one of the points that were raised almost immediately about that idea were the conflicts of having investigation and adjudication within the same body. Yeah. How have you overcome those, Thanks, those sorts Andrew. of concerns? Una, would you like to um, address right. some well, of those questions? Just as well, I, 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 we have the rest of the conference for me to answer that. that <laughs> sort of how, uh, <laughs> the rest of the day. Um, okay, so just to talk a little bit about um, what happened, and I, obviously I went very quickly through the organisations that were merged, but just to explain that in the organisations that were merged in the adjudication bodies, there was the Rights Commissioners, the uh, uh, Employment Appeals Tribunal and the Equality Tribunal. So those, those three bodies, the first instance elements of that were all brought together. So in fact, the Workplace Relations Commission deals with, um, as well as NERA, as it was called, sorry, the National Employment Rights Authority, that was the inspector at hand. So I'll, I'll come back to that. But just to talk first about dealing with um, equality, discrimination claims alongside employment claims. That actually has been um, a, a very important and interesting and, and, and effective part of the system. So what used to be the case was that you, as an individual, uh, and I should explain perhaps that 17% um, of the Irish workforce, the registered Irish workforce, is non-national, right? So that's a huge impact of, of the European Union Association in Ireland. We have a very large non-national workforce. And of course, in the big downturn in 2008, 2009, there's certainly anecdotal and some data-based evidence that first people to lose their jobs tend to be the ones from mm -hmm. who are non-nationals. So people were taking unfair dismissal claims and discrimination claims, and they were going in various routes, and there was forum shopping, and you know, it would take you three years this way, it would take you four years that way, and all that sort of stuff. 
So what we have now is a system whereby um, you make your claim, and you claim under multiple pieces of legislation, multiple complaints. You could have a payment of wages claim, an unfair dismissals claim, and a discrimination claim, all involving the same you know, period of work. Um, they're all held, they're all dealt with in the one forum, in the one instance, by one person. So um, what happens is that um, uh, all of those claims are put together, um, and the person comes in about, by the way, about 50% of our complainants are not represented by anybody. They don't even bring their granny to the hearing. So that um, can be a very challenging part of the, this for the adjudication officer. And they parse their way through those claims and then at the end they come out and then their individual decision deals with each individual claim on the merits and decides whether on the facts it, it, there's a claim arising from that. That certainly has been one of the most efficient and effective parts of the reform, so that single forum with the aggregation of claims. Where perhaps it hasn't been as successful is that we also deal with equal status claims. And unfortunately, um, I don't think there's a visibility about the fact that we also have that, that um, jurisdiction. So for example, if you're um, a young man of Indian extraction, for example, and you're thrown out of a nightclub in Ireland because of your age or your race or whatever, taking your claim to the Workplace Relations Commission probably isn't where you think to go. But in fact, that's the jurisdiction we have. So one of our challenges for the future is going to be trying to get that visibility around that jurisdiction out to people who need it. Um, with regard to the challenge of inspection versus um, adjudication, um, it certainly was one of the things that employers, I think, were most nervous about. They were afraid that if a complaint was made against them on one of the other grounds, payment of wages, whatever, it would automatically trigger an inspection from my inspectorate arm. And I had the privilege of being told recently by somebody I know that um, short of a, 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 an, an audit by the revenue commissioners, an inspection by the Workplace Relations Commission inspectors, the next most feared, um, which is pretty hard because actually we try to achieve compliance. What we're there for is to try and get employers and employees to make sure that their rights are being complied with. Um, we try and maintain a very strict Chinese wall between them. So it, it is the case that um, if a complaint is made for adjudication, it won't trigger an inspection. However, if a complaint is made looking for inspection, yes, it will go into an inspectorate arm. And one of our biggest challenges has been, to, one of the things we're going to have to think about for the future in terms of efficient use of our resources is that if we're seeing a single employer getting lots of complaints requiring adjudication, would we not be just more efficient sending in an inspector and trying to sort it out? So that is a challenge for the future, one we haven't yet addressed, um, but maybe at some point um, something we'll have to think about. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's ongoing. We haven't really, funnily enough, people seem to have settled into an acceptance around the role. And I suppose one of the other things just to say is that um, in general terms, our inspectors are looking for baseline compliance. Are you giving people your hours? Are you paying the minimum wage? You know, it's looking at a different class of employee to the ones who tend to make complaints, sort of. So it's looking at a different structure and a different arrangement. One of the things we're thinking about for the future is training our inspectors more generally into dealing with workplace mediation, workplace disputes more generally, and sort of multi-skilling them. And that is, um, so we've just sent out applications uh, to people who want to be trained in this. Uh, we've been overwhelmed by the response from our inspectors. They obviously want to start doing more kind of hands-on dispute resolution. Uh, so one of the challenges I now have is trying to whittle down the overwhelming, yes, please, please train me in doing this, down to the eight or ten people we can cope with in year one. And that, um, that's going to be, but that's an interesting part of the cultural shift within these five organizations and trying to bring them into one is going to be part of that training space. So it's a challenge, but it's one we're managing to cope with so far. Thank you, Una. Uh, really um, interesting to have it sort of elaborated and those, those issues that we've sort of dealt with in various ways over the, over the years in Australia as well. Are there any other questions? Yes, yes, Cameron. Oh, we're just, just here, thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Kate. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bongani from South Africa. My question is to Justice uh, Rose. You were talking about having some maps that give you intelligent information in terms of where disputes arise. It's the same system we have, and we have some response to that through something similar to your workplace advice clinics by going to those areas and provide support. 
But what we have experienced, which I want to check what's your experience, is that wherever we go to attend to those areas, instead of reducing disputes, we see an increase because people become more, <laughs> people become more aware and then it increases our workload, so to speak. Yes. Is that the same experience that you have? Um, I can't tell you whether we've had that precise experience, but um, there's a certain logic to it and I would expect that we would have it. Um, because as people become more aware of their rights, uh, they're more likely to take action. What we saw, we did a review of, we had a similar program working in Western Australia for a while. And we deal with um, general protections claims, adverse action. So an employer, for example, terminates someone's employment because they've raised a workplace right issue and it's unlawful and they can take an adverse action. We deal with them in conciliation. Um, we were finding that a large number of those complaints um, didn't really fall within the legislative framework. They were really underpayment claims, etc. So we, we did a triage pilot in Western Australia and referred them to a community legal centre for some advice. And my recollection is about a third of them withdrew and litigated elsewhere. The Federal Court has a similar scheme operated by Pilch in Queensland. The same thing. Self-represented parties, they're automatically referred to get um, legal advice on a pro bono basis. And again, about a third of them withdraw or litigate elsewhere, um, which is, I think, a good result for the system generally because um, people are litigating their claim in the right jurisdiction. It's better for them because if they persist with a claim for underpayment through a general protections route, they get to the end of a very long tunnel only be, to be told, we can't help you, and they've got to start again. And the risk you run there is that they get immersed in the legal system uh, and it can take over their lives. But yeah, I expect that um, uh, it may well lead to um, some increase in workload. It may also lead to uh, some diversion of work because matters that involve underpayment, etc., at least at the moment, um, would be dealt with um, elsewhere and referred to the Ombudsman. Um, so it acts as a bit of a gatekeeper for that. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Um, yes, thank you very much. Up two questions, um, Kate. Sorry, in the, the table's just up. Lauren's there. There you go, thank you. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, your name and where you're from too, sure. thank you. Hi. Uh, so my name's Nigel MacDonald and um, I'm from a company called Tyler Technologies um, and we are involved in online dispute resolution so I make no uh, apologies that this is some vested interest in the discussions going on. Um, but I was very interested in both um, Justice Ross and uh, Una's comments around location, um, access to justice, um, the removal of fear around litigation, etc., etc., and I'm just wondering whether you have or are considering an option rather than just going to libraries, etc., which I completely understand involves the community and is a great idea, uh, but whether online dispute resolution, uh, where both the mediators and the parties can you know, have easier access to um, the, the whole process, is of interest to you. Thank you. Um, yeah. The short answer is yes, we are. Um, but within our organisation, um, I'm probably the least qualified to talk about IT. Uh, the only one that would be um, <laughs> would be Bernadette, who is even less qualified than I am. Um, but but there is there is a a current project on online dispute resolution within the organisation. It was kicked off. Um, by a conference that RMIT um, Justice Area ran and they brought out some uh, academics and practitioners from the Netherlands where they have a very active online dispute resolution platform in family law is where it, yes, where it started for them and we were looking at well how can we um, get into that space and look one of the things we're giving some thought to at the moment is in the unfair dismissal area sort of almost before they get to a telephone conciliation, you might provide a safe electronic environment 
in which parties can exchange views and put proposals to one another. Um, but it's in the early stages for us, but we're definitely uh, interested in doing it. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, we have uh, we have tried to divert people into. Well, first, of all, we're trying to divert people into mediation away from adjudication, and we've discovered uh, an interesting. Uh, side effect of the efficiency of our adjudication scheduling system, which is that we're not giving people enough time. Um, so what is happening is we're saying we're encouraging them into mediation, and then they get their date for their hearing, and they say, ah, to hell with it, and they go on for adjudication. So, so that's one psychological effect. The second psychological effect we've had is that we have a, we seem to have detected kind of a cultural resistance to doing things other than face to face a little bit. So we have a telephone-based mediation system, um, which we encourage people to use. And in fairness, we do get some great results out of it. But what we're finding a little bit is that people actually want face-to-face. -face. So we're having to offer more and more face-to-face -face mediation, um, which um, is something we're, uh, we're intrigued by. And whether that's a cultural thing in Ireland, I want to say the whites of his eyes before, you know, <laughs> whether it's a cultural problem. I, I keep on harping on lawyers. I don't know why. I've been I've, I've, I've down on them this morning. I must have slept badly last night or something. But uh, obviously, s some... Some in the legal profession would prefer face-to-face -face because, of course, they can, you know, it's, it, there's an activity to it. Um, I, I, I think one of the things we might think about, and I've been talking to Anne about this, is we might try to combine telephone and face, so Skype calls, and see whether mm. the, the combination of that is helpful because um, I think there's still value in, in trying to do as much as possible, um, you know, reasonably efficiently and, and in people's own time. I'm very interested to hear, for example, about the Thursday evenings and the Saturdays and actually the libraries, one of the things we want to try and start using is court, we've approached our court service to see can we use their court system in the downtimes um, to save ourselves the cost of hotel rooms and things like that, which is what we use for, for our uh, adjudication um, in, in, in our non-office locations. Um, but actually, thinking about it, it, courts started themselves quite an intimidating thing mm -hmm. to use. Mm -hmm. So perhaps maybe we should be thinking a little bit more outside the box, like using public libraries, mm -hmm. actually. So that's, a, that's an interesting, con not shopping centres, but public libraries, perhaps, you know. So, um, but what we found is a real challenge to get people, what we deal with is very human. It's people having fights in the workplace, you know, and they tend to want humans to solve their problems because they've had a problem with another human being, you know. So I think that's part of what we have to deal with very much. The great news is it means, of course, we'll never be redundant, you know, to that's ourselves. <laughs> Unless the robots take over all the jobs. Yeah, that's true. That's, right. that's very true. And I, and I think that actually libraries are moving into shopping centres or shopping centres are moving into libraries. I'm not sure which way it's yeah. going, but I've witnessed that in Australia. Uh, we do have another question up the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Giles Bray, the Australian Education Union. Thank you. Um, I just have a, on the artificial intelligence side of things in terms of what role that can actually play in dispute resolution because just from sitting as a practitioner, obviously there's a vested interest here, um, but there's also a huge gain in terms of managing the kind of volume issues that a union can have in terms of the number of issues that flow through and the volume issues that also come through for the uh, tribunals that are dealing particularly with individual disputes. And there seem to be two particular points at which where, as practitioners, we intervene not as specialists in a technical way, but specialists in an emotional way. And that is particularly in the areas of providing that support for trade-offs. That's the really particularly emotionally difficult part, often for a client or a member, where we're intervening, where we're actually using human-level support, which seems difficult to understand how artificial intelligence can support that. But also in the triaging part of it, where we have a, either a non-forthcoming client or a non-forthcoming member who's maybe not disclosing exactly what they're seeking or even all of the facts around the circumstances. And it takes a level of human intervention there again to actually see maybe where the gaps lie. And I'm wondering, because family, that family level dispute is really interesting, because that's an even more emotional field of law than what we're dealing with here. And what experiences actually come out of that, that artificial intelligence can be used to assist those two parts of the process where for me, as a practitioner, I see it almost very impossible for it to be a sort of a, a robot-style intervention. Yeah, terrific question. Thank you. John, would you yeah, like to uh, respond? First, first of all, I, I don't ever see it being a robot-style uh, intervention. I, I believe the most you can do is to have the artificial intelligence be human-assisted. 
okay? How you use it really is, is up to the organisation uh, and what they see. Within the family area, yeah, there are, there are the problems, obviously, what you want to do, and that's where you need the humans to uh, engender good relationships. If you're going to go into uh, parenting children, you need some form of cooperation. For example, Australian law wants a significant uh, involvement by both parents, but to do that, they have to be able to work together. But often, particularly in the early days, we're talking about... Uh, face-to-face uh, -face and things like that, often a lot of parents don't want to be involved in face-to-face -face mediations. If there's been domestic abuse, uh, they want separation. I mean, my wife, I, I know family dispute resolution very well because my wife is uh, a family dispute resolution practitioner. They often have to do shuttle mediations because they don't want to be in the same room. So there's, uh, there's that benefit. Uh, there's also uh, distance uh, can be a real issue. But what are uh, the idea of trade offs uh, and things like that are, are simply coming to, uh, you know, creative decision making. It's uh, win win and things like that. People, sometimes uh, people don't realise that there are other options. I mean, sure, uh, a mediator can provide those options, but if you have a whole lot of past experience and cases, if you can learn from that, if you can learn uh, from uh, what your preferences are, uh, I, mean, I mean, one fascinating example that we did was we actually used the system on the Middle East dispute, and uh, we came up. And one of the problems is, and I was the one who decided uh, what the values of the parties wanted and what their interests wanted. And the answer was almost exactly the same as the Oslo Accords of 1993. And you may recall uh, in those, uh, it, it looked as if there finally was peace uh, and uh, Arafat, Rabin and Perez all won Nobel Prizes for their work. It unravelled a uh, year later, and the reason it unravelled had nothing to do with a lack of a good solution. And what we're all looking at is getting parties uh, together, providing them uh, with useful solutions, and that AI can possibly give them a good solution. What it can't do is have them trust each other. And you know what happened in the Middle East. Uh, was was a lack of trust, further incidents. They keep on happening every day, and I would actually say it's even futile looking for uh, resolutions in the Middle East. The best you can do is to have the parties work together. If they can work together for 20, 30 years, then maybe you can look at it. So the really sensible thing is not to just throw AI or automation at a problem, but is to very carefully investigate what you want, what, is go what are going to be better techniques for the disputes you're dealing with, and then see how AI can deal with a very small section of that dispute, Thanks, not with John. the dispute globally. And generally, we've been looking globally. Mm, thank you. I think that issue of trust is one that um, people in the room must be familiar with. And I, I wanted to ask Ian Ross and Una if they wanted to comment on that using AI for trade-offs and um, perhaps resolving disputes, providing the background information perhaps. Ian, have you um, considered that? I think it can assist in some disputes. Um, for example, if you've got a dispute about underpayment, um, the Fair Work Ombudsman have a, has a tool online that you can calculate what a person was entitled to, etc. Um, but I'll i probably go back to the comment that Una made, that these are uh, people-based mm. uh, disputes. And so I think it, it's mm. probably limited in that way. If we could find a, um, an artificial intelligence system that could assist with agreement interpretation, I'd be all for it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
won't comment on that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Una, did you want to say um, one last thing about this area? Well, it's, it's funny, it was actually the Middle East uh, example that, that came. I, I'm conscious of the fact that at the moment at home in Northern Ireland, uh, rather Northern Ireland, um, despite the fact that they have been in government together for 20 plus years, uh, the parties have are currently failing to come to an agreement over mm -hmm. whether the Irish language should have its own individual act or not. And actually, all of that is about uh, lack of respect. It's a fundamental dispute about two sides just n not not seeing eye to eye, even though they have effectively worked, or they've sought to work together for 20 years. Um, I think AI could be very useful in terms of triaging things. I think of trying to stop things coming into the system and in trying perhaps to give people enough tools to decide whether they want to pursue a dispute mm. or things like that. But fundamentally, once you've gone beyond a certain point, there has to be a human being involved. And that's, that's the, that, that because it is disputes between human beings. So that's the. Good, okay, thank you. Look, that brings us to the end of the first session and I'd like you to join with me in thanking our three panelists. Thank you very much.